Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been three weeks since the start of Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine. Uh, millions of Ukrainian citizens are suddenly in the depths of a humanitarian crisis, uh, joining victims of years-long conflict in Syria, Yemen, Tigray, and even more forgotten war zones. If there's anyone in the audience with friends and family in such a situation, our thoughts go with you. This is not a session about the Ukraine war as such or about the future of Europe. Uh, the focus of our panel is much closer to home. We want to talk about how the shockwaves from 5,000 miles away are registering here in Singapore, not in terms of inflation or supply chain disruptions, but in less tangible ways. After all, wars are not just extremely deadly, destructive and disruptive events in a physical, economic or ecological sense. They also cause what many experts now recognize as moral injury, an assault on our sense of confidence in peoples, including our own, willingness or ability to treat strangers in a humane manner. Which is why states invest lots of attention, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, in presenting themselves as engaged in just wars. Wars are also highly symbolic. Aside from the territory won or lost, wars can shift our mental maps. In the early 19th century, uh, Japan's, uh, sorry, I should correct that, it's the early 20th century. Japan's naval victory over Russia uh, helped transform the self-image of colonized peoples in India through Malaysia, the East Indies, Indochina, the Philippines, China. Sun Yat-sen embraced Japan as the light of Asia. Even after this infatuation with Asia's rising giant was brutally betrayed, Asia would never look at European powers the same way again. But similarly, there's a widespread sense that this war going on in Eastern Europe is some kind of historical milestone. But on the way to what? We don't really know. It's not even clear if this is something genuinely new or if it's part of a much older story of Asian anti-imperialism going back to the mid 19th century Indian rebellion. What we do know is that first, in this part of the world, American dominance isn't what it used to be, and that Asian states increasingly have to stroke China's ego. Second, we know that this shift will be especially challenging for Singapore, as arguably one of the most westernized countries in Asia. We've seen it coming for decades, but it has still not been an easy adjustment. My colleagues and I at Academia SG decided to host this conversation because it very quickly became apparent to us within the first few days of the war that events in Ukraine were triggering complex reactions from state and society in Singapore. I think it's a kind of antigen rapid test for Singapore's body politic. Our social media secretions are reacting with the news from Ukraine and like magic, multiple lines are emerging. Our hunch is that these lines are not false positives. They indicate something going on in our society. But what exactly? The instructions on our test kit don't tell us. This is not a science. It requires careful interpretation. And that's what we're going to try to do over the next hour and a half. On our panel this evening are my fellow Academy SG editors, Linda Lin and Ian Chong, and our guests, Kanti Bajpai and Walid Jumla Abdullah. Uh, to save time, I won't read out their stellar qualifications and accomplishments. I'll just say that Linda, as a longtime scholar of the political economy of Singapore and Southeast Asia, is well equipped to tell us about the interactions of business and state power, both within and across borders. Uh, Ian Chong is a specialist in international relations, including China's uh, foreign policy, and researches most of the themes that our topic covers, from sovereignty and external intervention to nationalism and big power rivalry. Uh, Kanti Bajpai also specializes in international security with a deep interest in the foreign policy of another post-colonial republic that's watching great power rivalries closely, India. We're counting on Kanti to broaden the context of our conversation so that it doesn't get too parochial. Wale Jumblat is one of the most perceptive political scientists currently studying Singapore politics. He's also the host of his own Instagram chat show. His fans know him to have an essential quality for resolving disputes. He is a good listener. 
And it's for this reason I want to turn to him first and asking uh, and ask him what he's hearing, whether said or unsaid uh, in Singapore today. Uh, what, is, what is your sense of Singaporeans' reactions? Can you give us some initial thoughts about what accounts for any uh, variations you see? Okay, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Chiran George, for that kind but slightly exaggerated introduction. Uh, and uh, I, I will time myself first, so uh, I don't exceed five minutes. So I have basically a couple of things to, uh, to talk about today or in, in response to Chiran's question. So the first thing, just to set the ground, it is true that Singaporeans are generally supportive of the government, right? This is the background. And uh, with, with some criticisms here and then, Singaporeans are willing to voice them, especially at the ballot box from time to time. But there is general support for the government, although I would argue that the support is declining, but it's still a healthy amount of support for the government. But on foreign policy especially, there is even more support for the government usually. And this is for two reasons, right? One is, as a small state, usually the, the options for foreign policies are, are pretty limited as well. And generally, Singaporeans find those uh, reasonable. So the general support uh, is there. But secondly, of course, uh, on foreign policy, and this is not unique to Singapore, right? When you criticise your government for foreign policy, you open yourself up to accusations of being traitorous more, right? Uh, so there's that uh, element as well. But generally, even our opposition parties, and you wanna, if you want to see where, uh, where uh, sort of the needle is at, you look at even our opposition party stances. Generally, they do not really criticize the government on foreign policy. So that's the that's the backdrop. And with that in mind, what I have seen so far is generally support for the government or ambivalence, like most Singaporeans, or a lot of Singaporeans, not most. They just think, oh, they are sad about the Ukrainian crisis, but that's it, right? Because it's far away, they do not know too much about it, it's not personal to them, a lot of them have never been to Ukraine. So there's support or and or, or ambivalence, right? So generally, that's it, I would say. Now, having said that, the second point I wanted to make is that there is a small group, I would say, probably in the minority, but it's not about whether it's in the minority. Uh, for sure, it's in the minority. The question is whether this minority is increasing and do we see a trajectory that in the past, there were, this minority group was smaller and now it's, it's getting larger. And this minority group is pretty critical of uh, the West and they are even pro-Russia in some ways in this, in this crisis. And there are really two main reasons or two main uh, interrelated reasons why this is the case. One is an, a general anti-Western posture amongst this group. Uh, and a lot of them point out things like, oh, there is hypocrisy on the, on the side of the West. You know, no, look at uh, what's going on in Palestine. Look at uh, the US invasion of Iraq. US has no moral authority to, uh, to say anything about this, right? And why are we supporting... Uh, the US on this. And that is something that uh, the criticism or the line of criticism is something I am sympathetic to. Even the, con the conclusion from that criticism is not something I'm sympathetic to. And then the second one is, and this is perhaps my, my biggest worry, and increasingly you see a more pro-CCP uh, sentiment among some segments of, of the population, right? And I think many, many years ago, Alfian Sa'ad lamented whether there is this, there is this desire for uh, amongst the Chinese population or a minority of the Chinese population to reclaim the lost cultural pride. I'm paraphrasing him. Uh, and a couple of years ago, Ambassador Bilahari Kausikan said, we must really be, worry or, uh, be wary of the insidious Chinese uh, CCP influence. And you know, when Alfian Sa'ad and Bilahari Kausikan agree on something, I think we have, <laughs> we have to take something, we have to take that uh, really seriously, right? And that is something I am pretty cautious about. And I've seen this before. I've seen this in the debate on Chinese privilege, for instance. I even see this initially in the vaccine debate. Uh, where people were anti, oh, these Western vaccines, right? Of course, there's the mRNA issue as well, but but there was this, oh, it's a it's a China 
a product uh, and they were more uh, pro in so i i really do worry if that is the case now i personally and and all of us here perhaps are, are critical of the government on some uh, some issues right but i personally am in support of the of the government stance on this particular issue right uh, so that's that's not the issue uh, the issue is what explains this this anti western anti government posture and whether this group is really on the increase right and i i would like to speak more about the points that i phrase because these are broader points later but it's already 5 minutes and 10 seconds so i'll i'll leave it at that thanks so much uh, wallet for getting us off to a, a great start already lots to chew on let me turn to linda um there were already indications in uh, recent surveys that there's some divergence between the uh, Singapore establishment and the wider public um, in their preference of big powers. Yeah? Uh, are we seeing that in play now in the Ukraine crisis? Yes, I think so. I think um, in a very quick answer to Walid's question, what explains this? This apparent uh, increase in at least in social media of anti-Western um, sentiment uh, with uh, some pro-China uh, baked into that. And I, of course, will link it to Singapore's economic model, right? And that has been a state-directed, um, multinational-led model, very plugged into a Western dominated global order to this day at any rate. So that's the overall um, uh, context, economic context. I think um, in Singapore, uh, I'm not in the habit of um, uh, reading, much less quoting anonymous Facebook posts, but I really like this one, which said, state capitalism in cahoots with multinational imperialism has hindered our social economic progress. Okay? So that I think indicates that there is a segment of population which sees the PAP government in particular as a comprador or an agent for Western capital, uh, providing low taxes, corporate subsidies, liberal immigration, which crowd out domestic enterprise, domestic talent, and hurt domestic labor. So I think that's, that's uh, one sense. It sort of fits into the post-colonial anti-imperialist narrative that certain elites benefit from our economic model, but not all of us. And that in particular, I think this might resonate actually contradictory with some elements um, of the elite, uh, themselves, private sector elites, for example. There are people in Singapore who feel that they are not benefiting as much from this economic model as they deserve to, being Singaporeans. They're not benefiting as much as foreigners. They're not benefiting as much as the state itself. So there is a conflation of, of anti-Western with some anti-state um, sentiment. Related to that uh, is... Um, you know, the pragmatism. Okay? So pragmatism is like a two-edged sword. The PAP has all along uh, um, enforced, well, uh, promoted the view uh, that we Singaporeans are pragmatic. We choose pragmatism over principle. It was therefore pragmatic in a Western dominated uh, international economic order for us to go along with the West. But now, since many people believe um, that uh, that's shifted, that certainly in our neighborhood, um, China is going to be the next, if not already, most uh, strongest economic power. So it's just pragmatic to go along with what they want. And if in the case of Ukraine, they are not taking a strong stance against Russia, why should we, right? In fact, China is opposed to sanctions, China. So we should just follow China. And that, I think, fits in with the uh, domestic political model, of which I'm not an expert, uh, which uh, basically says we go along with power. Okay? 
we are used at home to deferring to authority, to acquiescing to power of a single uh, dominant party state. So this is what we do at home, you know, who's most powerful will go along. Well, this is the pragmatic thing to do uh, internationally as well. And all we're saying is we should go along with what China wants because it's the power ascendant or already there. And that therefore any actions such as sanctions coming up very strongly as the Singapore government has uh, in support of quote, the Western uh, stance on this uh, is actually antithetical to the interests, long-term economic and business interests of Singapore by the government's own um, model that we have all imbibed. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Linda. Um, I want to turn next to Ian and, and pose to you a couple of questions that arrived in advance from, um, uh, from the audience when they registered. First of all, I want to thank the, uh, those who did register and did, did submit questions. You gave, a, gave us a lot to chew on. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to answer all of them individually, uh, but I think we've identified certain uh, themes that are certainly relevant to uh, what we want to talk about uh, today. The, the tenor of the questions, I should add, um, does uh, confirm our individual sort of anecdotal impressionistic um, uh, sense that uh, you know behind the very solid uh, you know a government Singapore government response uh, there is uh, quite a diversity of opinion including as as well it said um, you know uh, segments who are not really comfortable with Singapore taking a, a, a strong uh, pro Ukraine um, anti Russia stand uh, so these are a couple of questions that uh, were posed by audience members earlier right so if the Singapore public is indeed less resolute regarding uh, Russia's invasion than Singapore's official position uh, well number one should the government have been more moderate in its stand or should it uh, as these questions uh, suggest uh, done more to explain its stand uh, to the public Ian all right. Uh, thank you very much, Cherian. Uh, so I guess to quickly answer directly, I think more explanation uh, for why uh, Singapore has taken the stance that it has uh, would certainly be very welcome. Um, I'll go into more uh, detail shortly. Um, and to preface what, what I say, um, I, will, um, I, will, I will defer a little bit from uh, the rest of my co-panelists. I'm not a big fan of the idea of West and Asia because I think both places are highly diverse and so it's very hard to just reduce them. So in many respects, the European part of Russia is very much Western. Um, and when you look um, across Asia, you can't reduce India into China or vice versa, right? So with that having been said, um, I, I will note that the sort of early days of Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, brought about a number of comments um, really praising Singapore's foreign and security policy, right? And how we really need to back these positions, stay true to these positions. Um, I think uh, on one hand, this reflects a distance from things that are happening on the ground. Um, you know, what's happening on the ground seems remote. It comes across on TV screens. Um, and so for Singaporeans, it's not something that is so immediate. So, they, you know, they can sort of imagine, you know, wargaming, you know, fighting over bridges and, and things like that, um, where they can actually return home, right? Uh, this, I think these sort of claims um, underplay uh, the Ukrainian preferences and what's happening to people on the ground. It also sometimes overlooks um, Ukrainian self-determination, right? This sort of idea that, uh, you know, Ukraine is just a tool uh, for NATO or, or, or for Russia, and they should just uh, give in either way. Um, I think what that suggests is that there's perhaps a need for greater sort of discussion of um, of what um, of international affairs and also uh, what foreign policy uh, uh, for what Singapore foreign policy needs to entail. Now, um, I think that needs a little bit of unpacking. So. I think for one, um, I'm going to try and do some explanation. I think it, uh, the position that Singapore has taken is an understandable one. Uh, as a smaller state, right, um, one of the things that we use to get some level of equality, to encourage some level of restraint, it's not perfect, but allows more restraint than otherwise would be the case uh, on larger powers, is to play, is to assert that there are international rules that we all play by. And a lot of times, the 
entry to uh, being able to play with these rules to being part of this club is sovereignty. So that I think encapsulates a lot of the uh, claim uh, for the Singapore position that makes the international system more bearable for small actors, right? Um, so I think we, when we do that, I understand that, you know, there's a claim that, okay, we are too uh, pro-US and things like that. But if we think back about Singapore's independence, even pre-independence, a lot of our uh, prosperity from the uh, after the Second World War has come about right from being able to plug in to the system that was uh, at play. In fact, China's rise has been in part because it's been able to plug in to this um, more uh, broadly speaking rules-based uh, liberal system. Now that allows for a certain degree of uh, uh, stability. Um, you know, you you trade you know some space uh, and some uh, voice opportunities uh, for. U.S. dominance, uh, and you know that's generally how things have worked out. It's not the most fair, but it has uh, certain benefits to it. And so, in this regard, I can see where Singapore comes in on it. Um, but I think beyond that, um, that's the sort of official response that's been given. We also have to look at how our own um, economy is more exposed in some ways to uh, international forces. And I, and by this, I don't mean just the sort of uh, spike in uh, energy prices or, or food prices, uh, we have to understand that uh, Singapore being a financial center, we're far more exposed financially um, to, to, to the sort of um, uh, pressures of the international financial system. So when, when sanctions come in, when limitations on the SWIFT come in, if we don't comply, uh, there's the risk, we run the risk, right, of uh, getting secondary sanctions. Secondary sanctions being that if you, um, you know, you may not be a Russian entity, but you engage with Russian entities and help them with their trade, that can uh, trigger uh, uh, the, sort of, uh, the sort of punishment that come with these sanctions. I suspect that's also a reason why Switzerland decided to be much tougher uh, on Russia this time around, departing from its traditional uh, neutral stance. This is, I think, on some level understandable, but um, it's not really been discussed as much, but I think it should be on the table for us to consider since we can't rule it out based on um, the current evidence that we have. Um, and that aside, I think uh, there's also quite a lot of talk about how uh, there's this idea that um, NATO has provoked Russia. Uh, this has come about, I think, I've come across, I've come across it quite a bit uh, in, uh, in sort of my interactions. Um, and I think what is useful here, it's not really uh, that, I don't think in particular NATO has provoke Russia a willing uh, in an intentional way. Uh, NATO has been underfunded for, chronically underfunded for a couple of decades. It's led to cap uh, cap capability problems. That recent spike in uh, spending, that has, that's really belated. And remember, Donald Trump was criticizing NATO and threatening to pull out of NATO because he was arguing that NATO, with actually some reason that NATO was, was under, underfunded and undersupported, right? So um, that, that aside, right, there's what NATO is doing is one thing. Another is how um, Russia perceives what NATO is doing. And of course, that perception uh, does lead, uh, I suppose, Moscow, in, per, per, uh, in particular Putin, to, to see a degree of threat. Now, um, I think with, with that in mind, though, uh, we do have to understand that what has happened uh, in Ukraine, the invasion, is on some level a failure of deterrence. And, for, and this is important for Singapore because we like to talk about deterrence quite a bit. Um, deterrence is essentially the calibration of credible threats and credible assurances uh, in order to get an actor to maintain the status quo, right? to not behave in ways you, uh, you prefer not to. So whatever... Um, threat that NATO uh, provided, uh, whatever efforts that uh, they tried to do to bolster Ukrainian defenses prior to the war has unfortunately failed to discourage um, uh, Russia from, from invading, right? So this raises up the question of, you know, what is necessary for uh, issuing a credible threat, what is necessary for issuing a credible um, uh, assurance. And this, of course, is important to Singapore because a lot of what we do is to, is to uh, in our defense policy, is to focus on deterrence. So we do have to wonder, I think, uh, where some of the limitations of what we claim might be and what to do in those instances. Um, there's a lot more to talk about. Let me end there. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, uh, Ian. Um, I want to turn now to, to Kanti. I mean, a comparison uh, with uh, India is especially interesting, uh, partly for historical reasons. So we have a shared history as post-war colonial republics. Uh, India took 
uh, a different part. I mean, its position on the war now, of course, is very different. It's, uh, uh, but that, that position has deep roots. It was a, a key driver in the non-Rhine movement during the Cold War. Um, and so putting aside uh, you know, the, the, the current um, uh, situation in Ukraine, uh, putting aside India's uh, geostrategic calculations um, uh, over this particular crisis, what are the deeper currents in Indian elite thinking vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other big powers? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ch uh, Uh That's a good question. I think uh, that's a very important question, abstracting away from the day-to-day -day geopolitics. Um, I think what we can see is that India is divided or torn, but it's substantially at the elite level tilts towards a sympathy for Russia. And I just want to tick off a few sources of that just to give you a flavor for it. Of course, I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about why, you know, on the other side, uh, there is a kind of perceived need to accommodate the West and to be linked to the West as well. Um, but on the tilt towards Russia, which runs very deep, and as you say, it goes back a long time. I think the first point to note is that, um, and, and maybe best illustrated by looking at the recent Xi Jinping, uh, Putin statement of uh, February the 4th. Um, if you look at that and just deconstruct the main propositions there, uh, there's a, a, quite a criticism obviously of the Western liberal international order. Uh, particularly in its political um, elements. Uh, you know, uh, the domination of institutions by the West, the West kind of rampantness in the system, the West's insistence on things like democracy, uh, certain kind of economic forms, uh, its emphasis on human rights, um, its tendency to, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of run amok geopolitically and, and want to have its way in, in everything. Um, and it's disregard of the sensitivities and claims of, of others. And what's striking there is that there's not one element of that statement, uh, the Xi Jinping Putin statement, that Indian elites and the Indian government would oppose. Um, they're very comfortable with that criticism uh, of, uh, of Western uh, liberal internationalism. The only point, uh, and that's a geopolitical uh, departure for India, the only point that India would disagree with, uh, Indian elites would have disagreed with, was the trashing of the uh, Indo-Pacific idea uh, and the quadrilateral security dialogue, which is, as you know, uh, the United States, Australia, India, and Japan, that, that quadrant of powers. So at a very deep dispositional level, the impatience with or the resentment of or the fear of this Western liberal international order, I think runs quite deep in the Indian elite. And you know, at another level, uh, you can see that, um, and this goes back much further, there is in, in India um, a kind of an admiration for strong men rulers who um, you know, are in the business of restoring a country's pride, uh, endorsing a kind of nativist uh, you know, strength uh, that uh, use cultural nationalism and, and play it up. And uh, I mean, I think we're seeing that in spades in India now, but you know it has older roots in India. It's not just that Mr. Modi uh, has invented that kind of, of uh, political culture. It has fairly deep roots in India. And I think Putin's Russia benefits from that because he's seen as this big barrel chested uh, man atop of a horse uh, who um, you know, brandishes Russia's cultural attainments and, uh, and comes from a very uh, you know, kind of conservative position on social norms and, and, and so on, and, um, yeah, and, and, and isn't afraid to ignore liberal practices and norms to get things done. And I think there's quite an admiration for that uh, in India, and it attaches itself uh, to Putin's Russia. And by the way, there's quite a lot of, of sympathy for that view in many countries in the West, even if it might be a minority view, just look at right-wing extremists in, in the West and certain populist uh, currents there. Um, I think the uh, associated with this, there's, you know, uh, uh, coming more to the international relations uh, view, uh, and I think it's been said, uh, India sees a deep hypocrisy in the Western stance uh, on the use of force and its tolerance towards transgressions of international law. So I think that's 
you know, an, another kind of element of this anti-Westernism that's bubbled up. Uh, another is that, uh, you know, there's been much talk of uh, the Russian move into the Ukraine because it's defending its sphere of influence and it's kind of entitled to it. Well, Indians are very sympathetic to that. I think Indian elites think that South Asia from Pakistan at one end to uh, Bangladesh at the other, and from Nepal to Sri Lanka, if not to the Maldives. And that's India's uh, sphere of influence and it's entitled to do pretty much whatever it wants there. Uh, unfortunately, Pakistan doesn't agree and, and, and won't let it. And unfortunately, the Chinese encroach occasionally. But the general point is that to the extent that Russia has made the argument about spheres of influence, India is quite comfortable with it. And that goes against Western liberal internationalism uh, as well. And the final point I think I wanted to make on the tilt is that um, kind of a feeling that the West has never come to India's rescue historically since 1947. It's either always supported Pakistan or China, but there's kind of a Western perfidiousness, you know? Uh, it doesn't uh, live up to its uh, commitments. Uh, it uh, doesn't seem to see a stake in India's democracy. So there's another element of hypocrisy. The West practices realpolitik, why should it uh, now count on India to take a principled stand on, on the Ukrainian issue? Okay, so that's the tilt really that the Indian elites have towards, you know, kind of a deep sympathy towards very, uh, well, several Russian positions. But of course, at the same time, the Indian elite speaks English. Uh, many studied in the West. They dream of sending their children increasingly to the West to study and to settle. I mean, which Indian elite has not dreamed that, you know, all, all their kids will end up in with H-1B visas in the United States, even as they criticize uh, the, uh, the West on, on, on so many uh, grounds. Um, so, you know, it, at, at that level, there's a deep understanding that India can't afford to alienate the West. Um, and I think this also comes from uh, a slightly different calculation, which is that India internally has its vulnerabilities, separatism, terrorism, human rights, and there the West could, you know, deeply embarrass India uh, and even move against India. So, you know, the West has to be propitiated uh, in that sense. So there are two sources of kind of attraction to or appeasement of the West, if you like, which is one, you know, uh, there's kind of a cultural connect. Uh, then, you know, you, you want to get your kids there to study and prosper and flourish and get jobs. But there's also a desire to sort of propitiate the West uh, because of Indian vulnerability. So I think uh, the long and tall of it is that India is uh, quite divided at the elite level, but there's a substantial tilt towards Russia. Uh, and I'll just stop there. Thanks. I mean, already uh, one of the key themes emerging is this idea that, uh, and has been picked up on by the audience as well, that this isn't necessarily uh, a purely pro-Russian sentiment where we do see it. Uh, it is as much or even more so an anti-Western uh, sentiment. And several of the questions we received from the audience uh, drew a distinction uh, precisely along those lines. Um, the uh, I want to ask uh, perhaps Linda and Kanti uh, to address the sharpest of these points. Uh, should Singapore continue being a vassal state of the US? Uh, I mean, uh, you've made no bones about it, uh, Linda, that you see uh, uh, Singapore is very much uh, a cog in this, uh, you know, the, the global capital. Uh, cap machinery of global, global uh, capitalism. Does that make us a vassal state of the US? Um, and and Kanti, what's, what does it look like from the outside? Uh, uh, is Singapore seen as a vassal state of the US? Well, <laughs> I think in some quarters, yes. I mean, I've even seen, you know, people referring uh, to Singapore as a lapdog of the Americans, right? Uh, lapdog, handmaid, and whatever. And I don't think we are, if you look at the structure uh, of the economy, uh, yes, it is still much more dependent on Western trade and investment than it is on uh, Western, including Japan in this case, uh, than it is on say China. Uh, while China is Singapore's largest trade partner, uh, that's only in merchandise trade, and we're getting to be more and more of a service-oriented uh, economy. So in terms of services, uh, we do a lot more business and services with the West than we do in merchandise trade with China. 
How the US has long been and still is the largest foreign investor in Singapore. So to that extent, it is the largest uh, beneficiary of Singapore's pro-business, uh, you know, low corporate taxes, et cetera, et cetera, environment. And as global corporations, um, the business end does not necessarily follow any particular government political line, not their host governments. They basically follow, as a business, you would follow your own interests. So in that sense, Singapore is not a vassal of the US government because you know it, it takes it can take quite different the regime the polit the, the policy economic policy regime in Singapore is very favorable to US business interests so I mean I think I think that's true uh, including the contentious um, you know liberal immigration policies for example so US multinationals will bring in um, you know uh, talent from anywhere in the world mostly Western oriented talent, even if they are like Asian Americans or whatever. Uh, and that can lead to some sense that, that we are very much under American influence. But it's in the private sector and private sector and business interests are not necessarily overlapping all the time as we can talk more about this later. Thanks. Uh, Kanti, you must have heard this, um, this claim often as, a, as an academic in Singapore. How, how would you respond to that? Well, I haven't actually, to be honest, uh, uh, greatly, but maybe uh, I'm, I've just been in, in the wrong places. But I thought I'd give you a flavor of certainly looking at Singapore from India. I've never heard that kind of uh, point of view either. I mean, the dominant impression of Singapore from India is that, you know, it's a very hard headed, uh, pragmatic, I think somebody used that uh, word earlier, a very practical oriented, uh, tuned to business. Uh, makes very shrewd uh, cost-benefit calculations and so on and so forth. So I think that's the dominant image. A secondary image is that uh, Singapore uh, uh, very astutely navigates between big bars. And, um, and uh, one uh, place that that's evident is, you know, uh, Singapore's uh, championing in, in the Indian understanding uh, of a kind of open regionalism strategically, which means that you know, uh, in contrast to South Asia, where India has tried to keep the great powers out to try and manage the region. I think um, Indian strategic thinkers looking at Singapore notice that Singapore has uh, encouraged the idea that regional stability in this region, Southeast Asia, comes from having a, a good balance between all the, the big powers, the Americans, the Chinese, and uh, uh, perhaps the Indians and Japanese and so on. So I think, you know, there's a pretty good appreciation in India that uh, Singapore charts its own course, uh, and it may tilt sometimes this way, and it may sometimes tilt that way on another issue. But uh, uh, with a primary eye to its own interests and you know a kind of robust sense of its uh, independence. So let me leave it there. But I think that's that. Those two or three elements would be the, the dominant perceptions in India of Singapore, at least. Thank you. Uh, well, one of the I guess uh, criticisms of uh, the West that probably. Uh, is the hardest to refute because it's probably true, right? It's the, it's the accusation of double standards. And, and there, I think uh, one of the uh, most irrefutable uh, aspects of this accusation is uh, what uh, uh, is reflected in this slide here yeah, from um, audience members who suggest, you know, how do we support Ukraine while also recognizing the hypocrisy of the international community with respect to other issues such as Palestine. Um, uh, a Chinese Singaporean wants to know what is the Singaporean Muslim view on this war, especially in comparison with the Arab-Israeli conflict. So this goes to the heart of, I think, a point that was mentioned in his introductory remarks, uh, Valen. So do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, thank you for that. So I, I think for sure, I mean, we have seen uh, the the double standards, right? So even in sports, for the longest time, we were told that, oh, politics, there should be no politics in sports. When Celtic fans uh, a few years ago, uh, they brought Palestinian flags uh, to the match. Uh, UEFA sanctioned them, the, governing, the football governing body in Europe. Um, and now the EPL is having, they are changing. Uh, just last week, right? A couple of weeks ago, they, everyone was uh, wearing U Ukrainian flags. So 
can politics mix with sport or not or is there one standard for european countries and another for for uh, for non european countries and in some instances uh, journalists and commentators in the west have actually mentioned it outright they have said ukraine is not like iraq right uh, the UK, uh, one reporter said U- ukrainians have instagram accounts as if to show this is a measure of civilization right and so that is i think that that hurt is there even even when i look at it and i feel oh at the same time right you can be critical of uh, the double standards and you can be critical of the western mil- uh, the american military industrial complex and in the invasion of iraq and everything else while also ag- acknowledging uh, the aggression of russia right so we should the one of the problems is which it forms the backdrop to this as well which is the polarization uh, in in the world today and in societies where we really look at issues through a binary lens and social media doesn't help of course there's not much room for nuance on social media right uh, so it has contributed to this binary world view and binary thinking so one can very much be critical of the military industrial complex in the west while also be crit- uh, at the same time being critical of putin right in fact if you are really against the military industrial complex you really should hate putin because russia has given uh, the military industrial complex all the justification for its expansion that is that is going to be needed in the next 10 to 20 years right uh, so you can see that the the military budget the spending in nato and in america it will increase in the next 10 to 20 years because of this right so uh, and so i think we can we can do both not we can do both we should do both right uh, and just just to touch on the the final uh, the other question i i cannot uh, say that the muslim community is a monolith right it is not a monolith uh, so there are some people just like the wider singaporean society there are some uh, many who are uh, pro uh, or who are against the russian invasion and where some uh unfortunately sympathetic to putin uh but I, as i said i would urge that uh, uh everyone uh, to just if we are loyal to countries or powers we will always be disappointed because big powers behave as big powers are right uh so we must be loyal to principles that's that's what i would say thanks so much uh, well uh, i guess uh, one uh, the moral question before us is uh given the reality that uh, uh the world including singapore has underreacted to a lot of the injustice going on uh in um you know many non-european in particular uh muslim parts of the world the question before us is do we level down our concern for ukraine accordingly or use the the, the hype over ukraine to level up our concerns for other countries it seems to be obvious to me that we should be doing the reverse exactly the latter, exactly yeah. uh, and not ask for less concern uh, for ukraine um now one of the uh, biggest issues on on the audience's mind and and certainly uh, you know we uh, we we think it's worth discussing um is what the sentiments mean vis-a-vis uh, china and what divided loyalties mean right um the, the the main reason why singapore public opinion on ukraine matters is obviously not because it will change the course of the war but because it hints at how um uh singaporeans might respond when their country uh, is pulled between the two poles of the us and china Uh, I mean thankfully China is not Russia and in theory it should be possible to maintain good relations uh, between both uh, China and the US um how do my uh, elite and public opinion uh, complicate this balancing act uh, so like I said there are a number of questions that that touch on this I'm going to try and read out as many as possible as Corey shows uh, just a selection of them um Chandru asks uh, many conflations are manifesting this pro russia stance what's the main theme anti west or pro china uh, nicholas asks uh, are chinese state influence operations making inroads among singapore's populace and how can they be addressed uh, uh, 
Gerard asks, uh, has the divide in Singapore due to Singapore's racial makeup and the CCP's propaganda in print and social uh, media? Uh, Junyan asks, uh, with the gradual spread of China influence on our locals, would Singapore foreign policies and stance change due to local pressure? Uh, Jeremy says, what is the role race plays in influencing Chinese Singaporean susceptibility to mainland Chinese propaganda? Uh, Eugene wants to know to what extent does CCP propaganda through various avenues, whether PRC state media or Singapore, Malaysia, Chinese language media play a part. Um, Alfred asks, why does PRC propaganda uh, seem to find such fertile soil in Singapore? Um, uh, Stephen has contributed this uh, on numerous occasions. Bilahari Kausikan clearly hints that China extends its propaganda machine to Singapore, especially towards the older generation of Singaporeans. Uh, this has shown up once again, uh, should we be worried about it. Um, so various different ways of asking essentially uh, the, the same question. Yeah. Um, uh, Ian, would you like to uh, uh, address this this concern that is obviously out there? Yeah, this is a big <laughs> theme and it takes a lot of unpacking. So I'll try my best to, to deal with it. It's obviously a serious issue. I think um, one thing we have to recognize is that um, from maybe um, circa 2012 onward, uh, the PRC, and I think also it's important to uh, make a distinction between the PRC, um, so the Chinese state and the CCP, and also Chinese culture and Chinese people more generally, uh, even if they're Chinese citizens, because the, the two don't always, um, they don't always converge. So, um, so I think uh, on the one hand, since about uh, circa 2012 or so, the uh, PRC has been making a concerted effort to uh, push its own narrative outward. Um, and it, it taps on many things and taps on things like um, anti-imperialism, uh, a sense of anti, um, uh, anti-US feeling. Uh, it talks, uh, it emphasizes um, ethnic Chinese pride. It emphasizes uh, Chinese culture. In this case, it will wrap Chinese culture and uh, Chinese ethnicity with, uh, and make it equivalent uh, with, uh, wrap it to, uh, together with the PRC and make it equivalent to um, the CCP, right? And that, that's sort of very consistent with the C CCP's narrative really since its founding. Um, so the, the world is getting a barrage of this. And uh, in Singapore, uh, and Singapore is not the only place that experiences this, this kind of situation, um, is that there's a certain segment of society that is responsive uh, to such claims. Um, in Singapore's instance, uh, some of it has to do with the constant refrain that we should be cautious of the West, uh, that we are Asian. And so this um, CCP claim that, you know, it represents Asia and a certain idea of Pan-Asianism, um, that finds fertile ground with, with those groups. Um, there are others who, who find that, um, you know, because of Singapore's own policies towards um, Chinese schools, um, Chinese education and Chinese language uh, in the past, um, and they felt very unfairly treated with some reason. Uh, and this rise of the, the PRC, um, you know, represents for them a vilification, right? It's, you know, the, what they were holding on to was actually correct, but and they were unfairly put down. So they, so they, they latch on to that. Um, and then uh, there's and then there's there's the idea, of course, that the the, uh, the U.S. is hypocritical, etc. Et right. So there's another group that's sympathetic to to those sorts of views. Uh, co collectively, I think uh, what we see then is I I would suspect two things. One is in Singapore we tend not to be um, we tend not to be conditioned to be very crit critically minded. So we like to see things in terms of uh, disposition. Right. You are China. Uh, you know, good, or actually more succinct will be US bad, um, uh, West bad, right? So what is not West, in this case, China, good, right? But that really blurs behavior. So the US can act in good or bad ways, right? China can act in good or bad ways. Um, that I think that that distinction gets, gets a little bit blurred. Uh, so um, the sort of discomfort with discussing those sorts of things, with having more open discussions and sharper debates, I think... Um, handicaps uh, Singapore in terms of being able to address some of that um, uh, disinformation that 
you know, is, is coming across. There are other re reasons as well. The other point that I'd like to raise uh, on this is that in terms of Singapore, we don't have a strong, um, clear sense of uh, political values. Meaning to say, we don't have a sense of, okay, being Singaporean, we will hold ourselves, we'll hold those in power to these certain standards. We tend not to do that. Um, with a clearer sense of political values and standards that you hold everyone to, uh, then it, it provides a sort of marker, right? To say, okay, well, based on what we believe as a society, you know, how do we then measure what the US is doing or what the PRC is doing? But without that sense, um, then uh, this pragmatism that uh, Linda had mentioned uh, kicks in. This, uh, you know, uh, latching on to sort of disposition rather than situation uh, starts kicking in again. So, I mean, a lot of this has to do with education uh, and media literacy, which we really need to work on, but really haven't so far. I mean, and therefore now. That's fascinating. I mean, I think your, your point about um, uh, under-investing in uh, sort of uh, civic values, I guess, yeah, uh, that we recognize as Singaporean, as you said, I guess would not only make us more vulnerable to this, the call of pragmatism, but also the call of identity, right? Uh, so that's certainly worth thinking about. The, um, when you're talking about the Chinese influence, of course, it's not just... Um, uh, messages coming on WhatsApp. Uh, it's it's got uh, it's real, right? I mean, it's, it's you're talking increasingly about uh, uh, economic, uh, in particular, power. Yeah, um, uh, I'm not a China expert, uh, although I should say that I'm the only one on this panel who is currently on sovereign Chinese territory. Right? I'm in Hong Kong, so uh, I, I do have some sense of uh, <laughs> uh, of uh, the, the the giant that is uh, uh, emerging in Asia. The, um, and I, I should also share that one of the things that, um, that uh, bothers me, and I, I share this with my students in China, is why is it that as a, as a, as a country becomes more powerful, the second largest economy in Asia, clearly doing so well on so many fronts, you would expect such uh, an Asian power to be increasingly uh, self-confident and therefore more magnanimous, right? Uh, therefore having much thicker skin. Uh, but instead we're seeing the opposite. You know, this is a, uh, this is a China that uh, we constantly have to worry about whether we're offending in a way that we're not used to with the uh, Americans. I mean, of course, America will protect its interests, but we've never needed to protect American feelings. And, and I think that too is, uh, is, is new to, to Singapore. Uh, but but uh, Linda, I wanted to turn to you and uh, ask you to, to uh, expand on the economic dimension of uh, China's increasing integration with Singapore Inc. Does that uh, uh, compromise us in, in ways that it didn't compromise us before. Okay, so I think there are at least two groups. Well, let, let me back off again and say that my conceptualization of Singapore's economic model is a very Western oriented one by history, by statistics. A lot of Singapore's uh, success to date has come from being part of this liberal international order that's Western dominated playing by its rules and uh, interacting economically with the, the West uh, uh, or largely. Within this, some groups um, might have been marginalized. I think Ian sort of referred to that. Um, you know, Chinese educated who don't speak English well enough, to, certainly for the civil service, for Western multinationals and things like that. So there are groups that might be marginalized, but there are also groups who have a vested interest in making Singapore more Sinicized, or more Chinese, more Chinese focused, moving away from its current um, Western orientation. One group is a very large number of uh, Chinese new immigrants uh, in Singapore, um, about half a million in a population of five and a half million. And that's the significance of this as well, all expatriates um, all new immigrants have ties to their home country. In this particular case, I think that the new Chinese immigrants in Singapore haven't had to cut ties with their own country. 
right? I mean, because it's there, they have very close business relationships, business advantages, and there's so many of them in Singapore that they don't really need to integrate into the rest of society. They have their own associations. Um, they have uh, even social media platforms that basically are allied with, if not funded by the Chinese state and uh, exist to spread things of interest to a Chinese emigrant population, which includes uh, Chinese state views. Okay? So I think that we have one group that is very naturally, as many expatriates do, I mean, you know, I'm in the US and there's uh, overseas Singaporeans groups and, and the embassy keeps sending us stuff and, and so on. And so it's, it's a similar thing, except that uh, this activity of Singaporeans in the US is no threat to the America, whereas that the, the, the both relative size uh, of, of that Chinese group, Chinese new immigrants group, I'm not, I'm not saying they're disloyal to Singapore, but uh, like any, many emigrants, they have double uh, loyalties. And they will naturally, because they come, most of them come to Singapore because they think it's a Chinese, you know, they have been told by their own state, this is a Chinese country we can go to. Uh, and also because they go for economic interest, their own economic interest will take precedence. The other group is Singapore state and Singapore family owned businesses and so on that are very networked in China. We have big investors, right? We're one of the largest foreign investors in China, uh, Tamasic, our sovereign wealth funds, our GLCs, all are heavily invested in China. Um, and we have big businesses like uh, Wilmar Group, uh, Far East and so on, where they have, you have Singaporean businessmen who sit on say Tamasic boards and at the same time are on uh, CPPCCs, that is to say Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, right? I mean, I mean, can a Singaporean, so I, I don't know whether this is going to be allowed under FICA, but there are those interests and those interests, business interests will be very, very strong uh, opposed to any antagonism, any, anything that China doesn't like, right? All my, a big part of my, my money is in China. If China, China doesn't have to tell me anything. The Chinese state doesn't have to tell me to do anything. I know where my interests are. And my interests are in supporting Chinese views in my own home country, i.e. Singapore or wherever else in Southeast Asia. So I think that needs um, more attention to. It's a purely, again, business interest. It's not necessarily political. It's not that I support China and Xinjiang or whatever, but I just have to do what's good for my business. And the more pragmatic we are, the more China becomes uh, you know, economically and politically powerful. I mean, we know that way back during the South Korea TAD incident, right? We know that even small and medium-sized Singapore businesses who work in China got pressure to um, oppose this uh, anti-nuclear shield in South Korea. It's got nothing to do with us, but we still got pressure. And this was, you know, not a direct thing, the way the, the Russian uh, sanctions issue could come up to be. That's it. Thank you. Um, I just want to just add to my point about uh, the, the view from Hong Kong. <laughs> on, on the one hand, of course, uh, unlike um, many of my Singaporean friends, uh, those of us uh, you know, within these borders uh, have no illusions about uh, the seriousness of Chinese power. And in, in a sense, you know, the, the romanticizing of Chinese power is something that uh, people uh, at a distance can afford to do, right? Uh, those of us much closer can't. Uh, but on the other hand, I think also being in Hong Kong, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the there's been a ratcheting up of uh, American um, uh, anti-Chinese propaganda. Uh, some of it, frankly, racist. Uh, we see that uh, uh, increasing over the last couple of years uh, in in um, in the U.S. and it, it, I just want to register a comment by Hong Hai in the Q and A. Um, many establishment elites in Singapore see it as the U.S. hanging on to world hegemony in pursuit of which the U.S. is also bashing China. 
uh, they see Ukraine as a US pawn, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we've, we've covered some of this, but I think uh, it is important not to underestimate how um, uh, American rhetoric um, daily on, you know, in, in the media and so on, uh, is just inviting, in a sense, uh, a reaction from ethnic Chinese and frankly, even non-Chinese Asians like myself. I, I feel repulsed by some of the things that are said about China uh, in, uh, in Western media. Um, but I, I, on this issue that, uh, very important issue that Linda raised about um, uh, the position of, uh, uh, representatives of Singapore Inc, big businesses and so on. I, I do want to recommend um, a piece that Ian um, wrote for Academia SG last year uh, titled um, Addressing Foreign Interference in Singapore, Looking in the Right Places. And this uh, is about a very important political science concept called elite capture. And uh, I would uh, recommend this for bedtime reading later on. But I want to turn now to this uh, issue that has also, I think, seized a lot of our audience members on disinformation and influence operations. So Corey, if you could show some of these slides. Uh, I think many audience members are concerned about the, uh, the circulation of uh, misinformation. These are just some of the comments we uh, received. Uh, there, are, uh, there are more than that. Uh, you know, con concerned about how do we um, uh, combat this. Um, I, I should say that, uh, you know, at Academia SG, uh, we're not, uh, we try not to be ageist, so I'm not sure if we should um, accept the term uncle and auntie chat groups as being uh, politically correct. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even sure whether that is now recognized as a, you know, uh, psychographic or demographic category? Has there been enough research being done to identify what exactly we mean by auntie uh, and uncles? Uh, I know it's widely uh, used in Singapore discourse, uh, not usually not very flatteringly, just kind of sad. It used to be a term of endearment. Uh, it now is used as an insult. I'll just leave that comment uh, uh, there. Um, there's also concern about the role of uh, influential members of the establishment. Uh, these are just a couple of the points that to be uh, received. Um, and, and maybe we should spend a bit of time talking about uh, this, this issue of disinformation and, and influence operations. Um, I guess the one point to, to, uh, to acknowledge is that this isn't coming just from one direction, right? Uh, so as uh, Singaporeans and Asians, we've been duped by American propaganda before. In the 1970s, we bought into the American war in Vietnam, uh, in which the uh, US blinded by its uh, Cold War lenses, you know, failed to appreciate that Ho Chi Minh was primarily a nationalist uh, and anti-imperial and only secondarily a, a communist. Uh, 20 years ago, Singapore joined the US-led uh, coalition for the immediate disarmament of Iraq after Col Colin Powell lied at the United Nations General Assembly about weapons of mass destruction. And so, so we should be, I guess, cautious about the state propaganda wherever it's from. Uh, but I, I think one big difference uh, between US propaganda and Chinese propaganda is this. Uh, with US propaganda, we can usually find within America itself uh, not the state, of course, but always, and, and not always within mainstream media, but certainly in alternative media, in universities, uh, where Americans, uh, protected by their First Amendment freedoms, are able to challenge and correct their own state's propaganda. That's certainly not the case with political discourse in China, and, and I think that's one reason why we have to be uh, far more cautious, yeah, that uh, if uh, we feel sort of uh, culturally um, amenable to uh, what we think of as Chinese opinion, it would be a huge mistake to think that what comes out of China is genuinely Chinese opinion. It's far more diverse than, uh, than what we see, right? Um, so I, I think it's important to note uh, at least two points about modern Chinese propaganda that don't fit with the inaccurate stereotypes of a totalitarian state. Uh, first, it's not all top down. There is such a thing as Chinese public opinion uh, functioning autonomously from the, the party's publicity department. Um, and since we're talking about the uh, world's largest online public, what goes viral in China can, of course, spill over 
uh, into Singapore, even if that's not the intent. Um, now, as I mentioned, Chinese public opinion is diverse, uh, but because of censorship, it's mainly the jingoistic content that is more likely to circulate uh, rather than more reasonable or critical views with the, you know, that do exist in China. Uh, so, so I do, I mean, just to, to repeat my point, there's a danger that if, you know, we are Singaporeans who are receptive to Chinese opinion makers as maybe being more culturally appropriate reference point, uh, we need to remember that what we're receiving is actually a very skewed representation of the Chinese mind. Yeah? Uh, second, um, I think one of the reasons why uh, Chinese propaganda works in part is because uh, and this is also true of Russian propaganda. It doesn't only sell the merits of socialism with Chinese characteristics or whatever. It is not only selling the supreme wisdom of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, a lot of it, I think, is received in Singapore uh, uh, appreciatively because it goes on the offensive to point out that the West is no, no better, right? So a lot of the uh, the propaganda we're receiving, uh, I think many Singaporeans don't even realize that it is coming from China. It's not branded as, as uh, something from uh, a Chinese source, just that they appreciate um, the, uh, the West being shown a finger. And I, I wonder if, uh, Ian, you'd be able to um, tell us about some of the major themes or tropes that we can expect to find in, uh, in uh, the, this varied array of Chinese propaganda, regardless of source, yeah. Okay, so um, I think on one, there, there's several things, there's several themes that, that stick out, right? One would be that um, it will play up, you know, China's civilizational um, prowess and superiority. And some of that um, for people who are not um, ethnically Han, and China has, uh, I think, minorities can come across as seemingly a little bit too strong, uh, can have uh, also a rather racist uh, flavoring to it. Now, um, there's also the emphasis on China's economic success, that it is the, um, you know, it's the up and coming actor, it's going to replace the US, that, that's another big theme uh, that, that's in there. Um, and I think uh, in addition, there's this thing about what uh, sometimes is colloquially called glass hearts, fragile hearts, uh, so on, where there's a lot of sensitivity to criticism of China and that, that get a very strong reaction. And that, I think, has to do with the way that the um, CCP, um, PRC state, uh, is constructed, like many other authoritarian states. They tend not to be as accepting of criticism, right? So they need to show how strong they are. So they, that, that's, that when there is criticism or perceived slights, right? It comes. There's a sort of strong response to it. So that's that's a part of it. Then, and then there were slightly more um, nuanced elements to it. So um, certain sentiments about about Hong Kong um, and perhaps having more autonomy that you know is seen by the PRC state as not acceptable. Uh, a view of Taiwan as being a separate entity is, is not acceptable. They come down very hard on it. Um, talk about human rights issues in, in, in Xinjiang and Tibet. Uh, that the you know there's there's a lot of uh, that there's a lot of a backlash when, when those things come up. So there, there are these sort of themes that you can identify generally, but they 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 will vary. Um, and sometimes they get to quite absurd uh, length, go to quite absurd length. So for instance, Winnie the Pooh being banned uh, in, uh, in China because um, there's a meme that goes around that sort of caricatured uh, Xi Jinping as Winnie the Pooh with uh, Obama being Tigger, right? And so they thought that was a slight to the leader. So you have these, these things that are going on as well, sometimes a bit silly. Um, I also do want to touch on the sort of US anti-Asian thing, uh, anti-China thing a little bit um, because I think it's, it's related. So I. On, on the US side, at least on the, on the policy circles that are less uh, sort of worried, generally speaking, about race, although I think Donald Trump was an exception there, um, there's been a big disappointment with engagement. There's a big argument that engage, engagement has failed the effort to socialize China to accept, be more acceptant of prevailing rules that's sort of failed. So there's a lot of disappointment there. And uh, a lot of pushback uh, on China pol on policy terms uh, comes from that sort of strand. Now, at the same time, um, there is also this view that um, I think certain more racist elements of Chinese uh, of the uh, U.S. population has picked up. There's this anti-Chinese view. They latch on to this sort of 
policy position about being disappointed with the PRC, the state, as and they sort of racialize it, right, which is uh, quite common. Um, and of course, some of that pushback saying that, you know, the US is funding it racist, some of that is played up by uh, Asian Americans uh, with good reason. At other times, it's a bit manipulated as well. So when you look at the um, US narrative about um, about China, it's actually quite varied. And some it for people not paying attention to this um, generally, you know, it's easy to, to miss, but that inattention can lead to a certain degree of uh, misunderstanding. Just want to highlight that. Okay, can I jump in here? Yes, please. I just occurred to me, you know, since I'm the one that's in the US, uh, um, I'll just tell a quick story from when I first arrived in 1972, which you will recall. And, and, as, some, is, and as someone who is in China, I promise not to get offended. Okay, okay, yeah. So anyway, so I, I show up in 1972, which is during the Vietnam War, right? I go to Yale University. There's only one graduate dorm on campus, uh, very hard to get into. Uh, I'm in a long line of people, you know, to put our application. And this woman comes up to me and says, are you Chinese? And I said, yes, and she's Chinese. She said, I give you my room. So should we, we cut the line ahead. Not surprisingly, within a couple of years, the Helen Hadley dorm was overwhelmingly Chinese, right? So I never saw this woman again. I didn't know who she was. At the same time, I landed in the United States on a campus, which are all anti-war, right? Anti-Vietnam War. And when I show up uh, in Ann Arbor, it's even more so. We are the, the university which, uh, uh, initiated the teaching, Vietnam War teaching. And so much so that in 1975, at the fall of Saigon, uh, we put up this, um, in my uh, economics PhD class, we put up this huge Viet Cong flag, right, in our room. The next day, somebody had turned it upside down, probably the janitors, okay? So I'm just citing that to show that in the US itself, people are automatically anti-government, certainly on campuses, right? And it's not just as a diversity of voices, but conservative groups like, I don't know, Wall Street Journal editorial page are constantly saying that American campuses are anti-American, right? There's a whole ranking. So what this does is it creates a lot of raw material of white people saying America is bad that then circulates on this Chinese WhatsApp video. See, Americans said it, white person said it must be true, right? Never mind that it's all taken out of context and so on. But I think that that's absolutely true that um, if you have one power which has a, a controlled voice and another power which allows, you know, all kinds of, obviously, you will get, uh, there's a dissonance uh, uh, in that. I want to make one last point, and this is again purely anecdotal, stepping outside of my professional set, on Chinese, on young Chinese, right? Whom I have been teaching in my MBA classes and then more recently in executive education uh, for about 30 years. It's not just that there's a diversity of voices inside China that we don't hear, particularly among academics. There's also a change over time. So the very first Chinese that I had in my classes were those who were um, very, you know, they could kick the dust of China off their feet. Okay, China was poor then. They were just happy to get out. They were very pro-market, very pro-Western. Okay, even more ideologically pro-market than Americans. Then we went through a stage where they were very nationalistic. You cannot say anything wrong about China. This is teaching courses on trade policy, right? And they will put up their hands. And then more recently, last five to 10 years, they have become more diverse. You can get Chinese students to disagree with each other in class. And about 10 years ago, the Dean of our engineering school then challenged me on why one needed to view China differently. He said, and most of our Chinese students are in engineering, he said he'd been to China, he saw his alumni, he'd been to Switzerland, they are no different from our students in Silicon Valley. Okay, so there's a view 
that they have become that they're really capitalists, just like us. Okay, so and I would say that the most recent Chinese that I've taught from state-owned enterprises, they read the same books, um, they disagree among themselves, their views probably overlap with say American views, and you know, so I I don't buy this binary. Uh, going back to Walid's binary polarization, we dehumanize ourselves and we dehumanize others when we insist on categorizing them into. And I speak as an auntie of uncle and auntie <laughs> demographic. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I do want to go back to um, one point that has uh, captured, uh, you know, some attention among our audience, as well as even in the Straits, uh, you know, the, the Straits Times and uh, uh, wider media. I think, uh, Corey, I'm not sure if you already showed slide nine, but uh, could you go back to that? Um, Oh, sorry, not, not slide nine, it would be... Uh, slide eight. I think this is an uh, interesting point, right? Um, have, you, have you shown slide yet? Okay, yeah. Uh, so what is to be done, right? When it appears that there are uh, influential members of the establishment with views that uh, the establishment itself may find uh, um, uh, off track, even irresponsible. Um, I mean, I, I personally feel that uh, we should perhaps distinguish uh, between um, differences of opinion on a, a complex and contentious matters, you know, which would, I think, cover most of uh, what um, uh, uh, Mr. Kishore, as well as uh, Mr. Yu, have said, um, uh, separate that from outright falsehoods like you know the the, the current uh, instance of uh, disinformation considering uh, uh, bio weapons. The uh, the former, I would argue, maybe actually needs more space in Singapore. I don't know whether uh, Ian and maybe Kanti. Uh, agree. Uh, maybe Singapore needs more diversity of opinion within the establishment, including on uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, the latter, of course, is more of a problem that needs to be countered. Um, I should point out that, you know, we shouldn't get too alarmed by it because, um, uh, yes, there was that Facebook post, but uh, independent journalists like uh, Kirsten Han uh, immediately and quite persuasively uh, countered this view. Uh, she was joined uh, later by, you know, influential figures like uh, Shashi Jayakumar at uh, RSIS. Uh, the damage seems to have been contained, you know, if people want to uh, educate themselves what's going on, it's possible for them to do so. I don't think disinformation won. Um, one thing that uh, I should add, though, is that, you know, uh, looking at the larger picture of how, which I think is, is the nub of uh, some of these questions, right, how do we address such problems in general. I think one thing we can learn from this is that, uh, you know, we should actually empower, um, uh, you know, responsible journalists like Kirsten, uh, instead of beating down on them every time they disagree with the government. I mean, you know, she's uh, quite clearly done a public service in, in, uh, in the last few days, uh, ahead of the curve, you know, before uh, mainstream media did. She was on it, uh, responsibly gathering the facts that she could. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, she was piled on immediately because you know there's a there's a trigger, right? The moment uh, someone like Kirsten appears in the public sphere, the dogs come out. The PAP IPs, uh, assorted trolls, uh, beat down on her. They're just triggered to disagree with whatever she says. Um, and, and that surely has, I mean, part of uh, of of. Uh, uh, improving our resilience against um, disinformation, whether it's from establishment or non-establishment sources, is, is surely to, uh, to not um, abuse or harass uh, um, independent journalists as well as academics and other you know, clear, you know, uh, thinkers and writers have clearly shown their, their bona fides and their, uh, that they are responsible players. But I want to go back to this, this other point that uh, I suggested that you know, could the um, Singapore establishment actually afford uh, a greater diversity uh, of views? Must they all speak with the same voice? 
Can, can uh, I uh, answer? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, sure. But yeah, I really yeah. want to also hear from uh, County and Ian. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so, so I just wanted to say, uh, to make two points. First, uh, the, the call for using FICA, I think we must be extremely careful when we call for draconian measures to be used against uh, people whose ideas we do not like. Uh, because the nature of, of power is that, oh, the, the government will say, oh, I'm happy to use this, right? But then next time it'll be used and it won't be used uh, against other people, it'll be used against us, right? So it cannot be. And I think going back to what Yan said just now, if we are serious about uh, creating civic discourse, right? And a civic identity, that was the, uh, the phrase he used, I believe. And uh, we cannot just call for punitive measures every time somebody goes out of line, right? There must be space for us to debate and to point out, in, in the case of uh, former Minister George Yeo, right? Then point out publicly as was done. And I think, uh, uh, as you said, uh, the damage was contained. Uh, that's the first thing. And second thing I also saw earlier in the comment, and this is to, to your point uh, about diversity within the establishment, and then someone uh, maybe lamented uh, saying that uh, the decision to impose sanctions by, uh, by the PAP isn't unanimous. Well, I hope decisions uh, that are made by the PAP are never unanimous. Like, Hopefully they debate it, but once there is a majority decision and then everyone accepts, but if everyone starts agreeing on every single thing, I mean, that is one of the criticisms we say about the, about the PAP, right? There's no diversity of opinion. And so what? Like, even on the most controversial issues, right? If there, there is diversity, I mean, I would like that. I mean, even if it's something like way off the, way off the ballpark, I, I think I, I would want to see that as long as there is room for debate and for ideas to be refuted. That's, that's all I've I mean, that's certainly, you know, that would be generally true, but I'm wondering whether an exception needs to be made for foreign policy. Which, uh, does the establishment need to speak with one voice? Uh, Kanti, in, in, in theory, what, what would that be? What would be your take on that? Well, in theory, uh, I think you can say fairly confidently that, um, you know, you're fated to diversity. Uh, every country is, pretty much. Uh, and there are some you know, degrees of of uh, difference, obviously. I mean, even in China, there are differences. Uh, and uh, if you saw Putin addressing his generals uh, uh, on television when he was talking about, you know, uh, going nuclear, I mean, just look at uh, General uh, Gerasimov's face. Uh, he looked like, uh, you know, he'd seen an alien from outer space looking at, at Putin. So I think he had a rather different view of what's going on. But I thought, uh, you know, I, I think on the issue of Singapore, you'll excuse me. I mean, I'm not Singaporean, so I'm not going to uh, comment on a Singaporean debate. But I thought I, I would say something about a kind of related point about how do you deal with online misinformation, disinformation and all of that. And I suppose it speaks a little bit to this issue generally, which is, I mean, it seems to me uh, the one thing not to do is to overreact. I mean, on social media, uh, you're going to get the most extreme opinions stated in the most extreme and provocative terms, because that the nature of the medium is that that's the way it works. If you start getting too nuanced and all of that, then it, it sort of doesn't. So I think, you know, the response has to be by whoever does it, uh, you know, very factual, sober, the tonality of your response matters. I mean, you can't match inflammatory stuff with equally inflammatory, you know, uh, responses. So I think that's one. Second, I mean, to the extent that societies have regulatory structures and understandings with the social media providers, then you can rely to some extent on that kind of filtering some stuff out. And I think that's uh, perfectly appropriate and pretty much every society does it. Um, and the third is I mean, kind of a marketplace uh, thought, which is, you know, over some longer term, uh, and maybe it's associated with the first point, there will be pushback from a lot of sources, you know, you can pretty much rely on that except in deeply controlled uh, societies. And so, you know, one inflammatory point of view will be countered, uh, there will be a kind of almost inevitable check and balance going on. So, I mean, I'm not saying leave it to that, but I'm saying, let's not despair about, you know, voices coming out from all kinds of levels and agencies and so on. Let's not think that the general public uh, are without intelligence and critical dispositions. So, I, I mean, I guess my, I'll summarize that by saying, um, you know, yeah, you're fated to diversity, 
but in any case, um, uh, rely on uh, the intelligence of a general public and don't overreact, you know. Wise words. The, um, uh, Ian, do you want to address that point about uh, diversity of opinion um, coming out of Singapore's foreign policy establishment? Yeah, so I think uh, in Singapore, one of the default uh, positions that we're very used to is to have some authoritative voice and then people sort of follow along that. Um, that may have worked in the past, but we are moving toward a, you know, with all, all our talk about disinformation and all that, right? We're moving towards a world that is a lot grayer. There, there will be multiple tensions pulling in different directions. So our society needs some way of addressing this. And sometimes it's not about having some authoritative voice come out because um, there'll be questions about, well, what's the process? How did these positions come about? But um, part of the process of having a debate is to sort of show people, okay, th these are the different considerations, right? And um, you know, generally that there will be sort of le leaning to to some side or, or the other. It's not going to be unanimous because also if you're looking for unanimity, you'll never get agreement because there'll be some disagreement somewhere. So I think to be used to this idea that there will be discussion and that and debate and that the debate can stick to the issues, doesn't have to get personal, doesn't have to you know get into issues of threat or like I was talking about in the PRC case, right? This fragile heart sort of uh, syndrome. Uh, I think that will be healthier for Singapore. It will allow us to be more robust. It, allow, it will allow a society to be more agile, to adjust to different kinds of situations and to understand that sometimes things, ideas that we hold on to, uh, they can be challenged. Uh, situations can change. Uh, and so to be more adaptable, I think will fit, will help Singapore more, right, in a world that is more contentious, where there's a lot more grey. Thanks so much. Um, we, we are approaching the end of the uh, our intended time. Uh, it's already been one and a half hours. I'm going to um, suggest that we take maybe 10 minutes more for um, uh, to, to, to wrap up. Um, there are... Uh, there's one whole set of uh, opinions shared by our audience that refers to the specificities of the uh, of Singapore's response. Yeah, I think some of our audience members also pointed out that look, it would be wrong to uh, to think that uh, any um, uh, hesitation or, or misgivings that uh, Singaporeans have about um, the government's response is purely the result of them being. Uh, you know, suckered by Chinese propaganda. I mean, there are the genuine uh, worries about, for example, uh, whether uh, Singapore will pay a price by uh, picking a side. Yeah. Um, if uh, Corey could show slide 10, which has uh, a selection of those responses, um, there, uh, uh, Kim asks, uh, and I guess her point is that, look, Singapore what, Singapore is an outlier compared to Singapore's reaction to the rest of ASEAN. Uh, Jay Hong uh, says, look, there's a new iron curtain. What does this mean for Singapore? When it has signaled to Russia that it has chosen a side. Uh, Arvin says, uh, some Singaporeans feel that as a small state, Singapore should have stayed silent on the war. What are your views on this? Uh, Joy asks, uh, how will Singapore seek to mend its ties as Russia lists Singapore as one of the unfriendly countries? Uh, Isaac asks, in the long term, would Singapore's sanctions on Russia have any effect on our relationship with China? Um, Pao Ang, Singapore is one of the first countries imposing economic sanctions against Russia. What are the costs and benefits of Singapore? Uh, Mohammed, uh, that's already on your slide. Th there's lots of chattering on the ground regarding why our government imposed sanctions. Uh, what would be the impact on us? Um, and so on, right? So this is just a, a, a selection of them. So th there are concerns about um, whether in, in real politic terms, right? You know, can we really afford uh, to, to be, be so bold, principle aside? Um, and, and I wonder if, um, well, who would like to, to address this first? You know, is it, uh, would, would it, would it be more realistic? Would we, uh, should we know our place and not stick our neck out so far, for example? Uh, uh, I, uh, okay, please. I, I sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I think uh, in some cases you can afford to be more principled uh, when the costs are much lower. Uh, and I think this is one of those instances, right? So if it was a country where Singapore was far more dependent on, it was a far bigger power, then perhaps then 
uh, maybe the principals would have to take a back seat or there would be uh, some more maneuvering needed. Uh, so one of the reasons, I think, one of the uh, uh, concerns that Singaporeans have, oh, if you take this now, then what about in other instances? What about the I saw I saw on uh, Instagram as well. What about Myanmar? Why hasn't why hasn't Singapore uh, done anything? So I would say in every for such a small country, every decision is really contextual, right? So even when it is based on principles, yes, the principles are there, but ultimately it still depends on the context. The context determines whether the principles can be fully enacted uh, upon uh, or acted upon. So. I do not mean to say at all that uh, from, I, I think there were a few comments that, uh, as well, that every person who is critical of the Singapore policy, Singapore government policy is a China shield. I, I, I don't mean to say that at, at all. Or, uh, or anyone who is critical of the West, the West, quote unquote, is a China shield. Not at all. But it's true that a lot of those who are critical uh, of the government policy are actually also pretty motivated by their pro-CCP or anti-Western uh, uh, ideas, right? So I think we need to distinguish that. So I do not mean to say that any criticism, as I said earlier, every policy should be up for debate, every single policy. I mean, and just now you asked, should there be an exception for foreign policy? Why should there be an exception for foreign, foreign policy? And then another person will say, oh, then there should be an exception for race and religion. And then another person will say there should be another exception, right? And then in the end, the boundaries for uh, discourse just get narrower and narrower. So it's, there shouldn't be uh, any uh, boundaries. All policy, policy should be up for grabs. I mean, this uh, question of, um, uh, you quite correctly cautioned us against um, pointing accusing fingers and uh, assuming that people are disloyal because they express views that we don't like or that are contrary to the official views. I mean, at Academia SG, we are very uh, familiar with that, by the way. <laughs> But it's all the time. So, so we, we certainly uh, are absolutely uh, not in favor of, uh, you know, mindlessly questioning Singaporeans' uh, loyalty just because uh, their views don't uh, fit with us. And I should add that uh, this is a um, um, condition that minorities are very used to as well, right? And in particular, the Muslim community. Uh, long before uh, um, the majority Chinese community's loyalty was questioned. We've had decades of uh, uh, Muslim Singaporeans' loyalties being questioned. Uh, and that, I guess, is just part of um, uh, our legacy of being a diaspora community with multiple votes. Um, and, and, and certainly, I mean, I think you, you've put it very wisely that we certainly should fight against this uh, tendency or instinct to uh, to point fingers and question uh, Singaporeans' loyalty without, uh, you know, uh, clear evidence. The um, uh, there was a, a question from Julian, which again I wonder if if maybe Kanti you want to take this as a, as a closing uh, um, uh, provocation. Um, It, it is because it's a point that we often hear, right? Uh, with, that we're pulled by uh, anti-Western views, anti-Chinese views, uh, there's Western influence, Chinese influence. Um, how, how do we avoid, uh, you know, sort of just throwing our hands up in the air and saying, look, it's all relative. And so, and, and maybe even, uh, you know, this becoming a kind of a post-truth uh, <laughs> conclusion where, where since everybody's trying to fool us, uh, let's just not even bother to get at the truth. So, yeah, how, if, if a student asked you this in class, Kanti, how would you, how would you respond? Well, I mean, I think that um, uh, as academics that we, we uh, don't allow people just to throw up their hands. <laughs> so uh, um, we don't, uh, I think as teachers, impose our views on, on our students, um, but we do uh, try and push them to think as logically as possible in light of evidence to come to a conclusion and not to just throw up their hands. So um, I, I think that that's, you know, I, and 
the, the general tendency of people is not just to throw up their hands, um, I think. Uh, so um, I'm a bit struck by the comment. I mean, I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, uh, people just throw up their hands. Uh, um, yeah, when you're confronted with a lot of information, uh, at some point you uh, you might just throw up your hands and walk away. But I think these, th these thoughts linger and you're, and you're going to, but it's the role of the media, of academics, uh, of political leaderships, um, of community leaders, uh, of forums like this, I guess, uh, to uh, encourage people not to throw up their hands. So, I mean, I know that's a fairly uh, conventional, banal thing to say, but sometimes those things are true. Um, so, I mean, I guess uh, for all societies, I would just urge that um, keep up the good fight in terms of, of encouraging uh, uh, straight and, and logical and strong thinking. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, rely on strong, um, strong sectors uh, across your society to, to, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep going. Um, so I'm not that worried about it, actually, but um, I'll just stop there. Yeah, I... Uh, before we go, let me, I let me also... Yeah, uh, can, yeah. can I come to you after just inserting this... Um, yeah this uh, clarification, which is which has been raised by some of the audience, um, uh, we should point out to the audience that uh, the, the, the only um, a bit of uh, uh, data right, um, uh, that has attempted to quantify these sentiments has come out from uh, Black Box uh, research uh, over the last uh, 24 hours or so uh, that, that show um, that by and large Singaporeans support um, the, the government stand on the Ukraine war. Uh, there's a minority that uh, uh, don't feel that way. And uh, uh, so, so we're not, uh, none of us are suggesting that there's reason for uh, alarm, right? We're treating this uh, as um, a discussion of possible trends that are worth uh, uh, paying attention to because before they become <laughs> anything to be uh, too worried about. Um, uh, uh, with that, let me turn to uh, to Linda for. Yeah, I was just going to uh, follow up on uh, Kanti's comments. I think while there is no cause for alarm, I think we are deaf. This whole episode has shown that we are definitely deficient in critical thinking. We should be, up, you know, we're handicapped by not having. Um, uh, independent professional media. Luckily, we do have people like Kirsten around, but we don't have enough uh, rigorous, enough venues for rigorous analysis of what comes. So everything gets pushed down into these anonymous sort of like WhatsApp chats, right? And I would say education is a big part of it. The classroom is a big part of it. In the business classroom, just like in the corporate boardroom, if you had only one point of view, it's a failure. You'd be fired from the board. You would get a D for your class, right? We expect and we encourage and we actually goad, favorite new term, goad the students into challenging each other. Okay? And if you look by ethnic group, by, by nationality group, the ones who are from countries that I would, gross generalization, I would consider more secure secure in their identity, are more willing to challenge their own establishments, right? So that's why I see the Chinese change in views, uh, at least in the next generation. I think that it's the people who are insecure, who are thin-skinned, who cannot abide um, uh, contradictory, uh, contesting um, narratives, right? I mean, in my class, if a student agrees with me, it's a failure, right? The student has only to agree with me after they've considered all the other options. So similarly, I think in Singapore, we've had a paucity of discourse that has all these different points of view. Once we go through all these different points of view, argue among ourselves, publish among ourselves, then we can be much more secure in our views and if we're secure in our principles and so on, then we can have, come, let me have it, right? I welcome your criticism. Criticism is a positive contribution to knowledge uh, and to policy making, making. And I think the fact that we have tended in Singapore to suppress criticism 
actually is the one thing that makes us most, most vulnerable to disinformation. Ian, uh, uh, closing remarks. Right. So actually, I'd like to go back to the quote that you, you had thrown up. So, I mean, this idea that, well, if you are critical of, um, of the state position or, or, or the... Um, or the, or the US or, or NATO, you're seen as a Chinese shell. I think uh, this is this exemplifies what I was talking about, right? We tend to, in Singapore, look a lot at uh, this position. Are you pro-US, anti-US? But maybe the question should be, what is the actual criticism, right? Um, what is that critique being thrown up? Um, is there some grounds to it? Should we be looking for um, independent corroboration, right? Um, but that in our sort of reaction in Singapore, we tend not to do as much. Well, I agree with Kanti that in the long run, right, people will tend to get better at these things. Um, but I think uh, in the short term, this is something that we, this is a sort of um, mechanism, right, muscle um, muscle memory that we, sh we should, re intellectual muscle memory that we should really build. Uh, because if we are looking at an environment where there's going to be a lot of disinformation, um, also misinformation, like something slightly different, um, there will be a lot of confusion. And some of the effects, the intended effects of disinformation is to sow um, despondency, confusion. Everything is so confusing. Everything could be true. I don't believe in anything at all. Uh, therefore, I will take, I, I will just be stuck in inaction. That's part of the aim some of the time. So I think uh, to be more uh, critically minded to push a little bit more beyond just what we see um, to you know try to source for different kinds of evidence see whether you can corroborate whether you can triangulate I think that's something that is a useful skill um, but it's unfortunately not something we're very acclimatized to in Singapore uh, and that's something where I hope right through this uh, episode with the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, we can see more so when things like Myanmar come up right we should ask so why is it uh, that Singapore is uh, more willing to act on on uh, on on Russia and let, less so on Myanmar perhaps there are business interests uh, at stake here um, uh, are, are those interests something that we should find acceptable or not I mean these sorts of issues um, are part of what should be uh, the general debate it's not to say they just debate without end or to or just just to take uh, one position or say well some act is really powerful we just have to uh, throw our hands up i mean there's a lot of this talk about not choosing sides in singapore um and sometimes it floats into neutrality i think what's more important for singapore is to be impartial I mean to say that we need to you know make decisions based on what the evidence is um and to you know uh, find options for ourselves right uh and that allows for the ability to sort of not be uh, sweet one way or the other too quickly. But that's not something that is in our discourse so much. Um, and if you talk about the establishment talking, uh, the, debating these issues, that certainly should be there, but is not uh, the, what is there is not sufficient at present. Uh, let me end there. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's very well put. So I think it, uh, what, what I got from that is that you know, these, these are skills that need to be practiced and nurtured, right? It's not, uh, it's not about how educated you are. It's not about getting credential, which then becomes, then expires after five years or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> but if, we don't, if you don't put it into action and becomes a habit, then we don't have that skill. Uh, Kanti, you wanted to... Uh, uh, yeah, just very quick. Uh, I mean, just to share uh, at the, uh, again, the anecdotal level. I mean, in 11 years here in Singapore, I've seen a change in my Singaporean students. Uh, they are more argumentative and critical minded. Um, and oh, so, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's, you know, that speaks to the, and the second is, I think, you know, this idea of liberal arts education. I mean, I do see that, you know, Yale and US, and then now what NUS is trying to do with its new college, um, you know, what, what is liberal arts education? It's uh, instilling this idea of, uh, you know, connecting the dots a lot better across diverse fields. And, you know, I think there is a sensibility in, among Singaporean students now to move away from just lawyering, doctoring, business studies, sorry, Linda, it's very important, but, you know, uh, that kind of career track to being more open to something like liberal arts and seeing where that leads them uh, in their career and so on. So I, I see uh, for Singapore as an outsider, uh, a lot of positivity in that respect. Uh, more talkative in the classroom and this move towards kind of, you know, uh, liberal arts sort of mindset.
Well, within academia, as you, of course, you're speaking of the converted there, it was just uh, what less than a year ago that uh, we organized a webinar precisely on that topic, the kind of liberal education that uh, Singapore needs easily accessible on our website, Academia uh, SG. But um, uh, enough of um, uncles like me speaking, let's uh, turn to the young punk wallet. <laughs> Thank you. So being an uncle is relative also. So uh, I wanted to go back to the point I made at the top of the of the seminar, which is this binary worldview. It's, it's really dangerous. And I feel that it's uh, intensifying, uh, especially when when we think of the world through, you know, through our identity politics. And we've seen this in the debates on, on COVID, for instance, on, on everything. Uh, we do not have nuance there. And Everyone is, uh, all layers of society are guilty of this, you know. So, just like us, for us, many of us here are quite critical of the government, right? And we are critical of many policies, but we are happy to give credit when, or we should be happy to give credit when they do the right thing. Like a lot of us here uh, are quite supportive of uh, the sanctions on Ukraine, for instance. But likewise, on those on the uh, on the government side or those who are pro government, right? They shouldn't also immediately, oh, Chiran George is a troublemaker, right? He's He has an agenda, right? Yeah, he has a, an agenda for sure, right? His agenda is societal change, right? And all of us, hopefully, that, that is our, our agenda. So I think hopefully later on in the future, academia.sg seminars, you can have uh, policymakers as well. Uh, debating with <laughs> with uh, academics and hopefully we can if we are really serious about uh, nurturing this culture then uh, it has to start somewhere and hopefully our politicians also don't go on just the friendly platforms uh, where they will get softball questions hopefully uh, we can really create this culture of discussion because Ukraine issue is the Ukraine issue is just going to be one issue there's going to be other issues where the issue of critical thinking and us in our silos, it will come up over and over again. And the solution is really a long-term one. I think, uh, uh, Walid, you were actually waiting for the courtesy to be reciprocated so that I would invite, uh, on your behalf, all policymakers to appear. <laughs> thank, on you. thank you, thank <laughs> you. Uh, right? And we're happy to receive that. Yes, thank you. So, so <laughs> thanks so much. I mean, I, let me uh, attempt to to wrap up. I think one of the uh, the the key uh, areas of agreement uh, is that we all have this allergy to thinking of uh, countries in this, um, uh, no matter how large or small, right? In in sort of uh, homogenous. Uh, uh, essentialized terms, right? Uh, and which is always a risk because I guess uh, wars uh, precisely by violating national borders actually accentuate that, right? So during a war, we tend to view the world as uh, color patches, as if each country is uh, internally one thing or should act like one thing. Um, when in fact, every national map and certainly even Singapore's uh, you know, small terrain is, is uh, overlain by these uh, complex charts of uh, diaspora loyalties, religious movements, anti-imperial movements, affiliations to football teams, boy bands, you name it, right? Uh, so the, the, the title of this event referred to contending loyalties, but you know, I think I'm confident that I speak for all five of us here, uh, that none of us want to suggest that we believe we'd be better off with exclusive loyalties to any single identity, right? far from it. Um, it. Indeed, people who elevate any one overriding master identity uh, have tended to cause much more human suffering than people who embrace uh, more fluid, hybrid notions of identity and who respect the fact that you know, every individual should be free to decide which identity to activate when. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, as a group, I think we've shared some concerns about the gravitational pulls and tectonic shifts that may be worrying for Singapore, but uh, we, we don't want to be too hasty with uh, mutual recriminations, right? Uh, we don't all need to be on identical ground. Uh, our minds should be expansive, critically minded enough uh, to accept that we don't have to have a complete consensus on everything in order to live peacefully with one another uh, and uh, contribute meaningfully to the world.
Uh, so this webinar has been part of our mission at Academia SG to uh, facilitate public engagement by scholars, uh, including on topics that some institutions in Singapore may consider too controversial to touch. Uh, and we do it because we believe in people like you, our audience, uh, and in your ability to deal with uh, sensitive issues in a, a civil manner. And I uh, greatly appreciate uh, the, 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 the civility with which our uh, um, uh, our five panelists have, um, have uh, uh, dealt with what is, of course, a series of controversial questions. So thanks to uh, Kanti Bajpai, Walid Jumlat, Ian Chong, and uh, Linda Lin, uh, our fellow editor, uh, Tio Yu Yen, who is uh, uh, in the background somewhere, our admin team for the evening, Howley and uh, Corey, most of all to our audience, uh, we hope you'll follow us um, on our website, sign up to our mailing list so you can uh, uh, keep track of uh, other uh, things we do, whether they are troublemaking or not, hopefully they are. Uh, and, uh, with that, uh, once again, uh, of course, let's not uh, forget that this isn't ultimately about Singapore. Uh, there are um, troubling things happening in the world. Uh, let's, uh, I hope we uh, can find it within us to have the, the compassion and humanity to try to make the, the world a better place in spite of the uh, depressing things going on around us. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, thank you.